I remember kind of like when it came to an end of the palace was uh, the band Guttermouth had played and they were antagonizing kids. It almost like got into like a fist fight between the band and people in the audience who were there to see other bands on the bill. And then like the, the show didn't draw well either. And it was just like kind of like my last straw with trying to do these bigger shows. Welcome, everyone, to This Was The Scene, the podcast that takes a look back at the late 90s, early 2000s punk scene. I am your host, Mike Doyle. Neil Sabatino did quite a lot for the New Jersey scene. Uh, Here is a list of shit that he did. He was booking shows at the Palace in Boundbrook in 1998, and then also did stuff at Hamilton Street and Bloomfield Ave Cafe, both when they first opened. He played in bands like Little Green Men, Stick Figure Suicide, Pensy Prep, uh, that was the band with Frank... Iero, Iero, Frank My Chem, Frank My Chemical Romance. And then he did his band Fairmont, which he's still doing. He also helped put out a bunch of stuff with Reinforcement Records from 99 to 2004. He did a zine from 98 to 99 called When I'm on Fire, I Yell Things Like Ouch and Help Me or Help I'm on Fire. And he gave away about a few thousand issues at the Palace, which were just, it was just three issues. That's pretty cool. And all this was a precursor to starting his label Mint 400 Records, signing over 95 bands, putting out 250 releases in the last 12 years, producing dozens of albums, still booking up to five shows a month, and starting the New Jersey Indie Rock Festival. Thank you to Scott Whiting Kivowitz for this introduction to Neil. Scott was like, you have to interview Neil because he did so much shit. And uh, I'm glad I did because I got him on the phone and this is what we talked about. Ryan Selleck, recording in a cabin, still running a record label, Dave Weston's solo album, Booking shows at the Palace, Not a Surf, Getting Kicked Out of Pensy Prep, that's a really good story, His Thoughts on Eyeball Records, Hamilton Street, The Landmeyer Show at the Palace, His Band Fairmont, and a ton more. He wanted me to let everyone know that on November 9th at Pet Shop in Jersey City is a 30-band fest called Indie Bench. This will be presented by Mint 400 Records and Friends. Mint 400 Records, as you know is his record label because i just said it earlier now for all the listeners if you have any cool stories from the scene back then this would be from 90 or you know early 90s up till about 2000 2001 do me a favor email them to me at this was the scene at gmail.com i've been getting a ton of response uh for this which is awesome and i have a couple stories up right now so if you go to this was the scene.com you can see some of them or read some of them if you go to scene stories which is the navigation bar so if you're on a mobile phone just hit that little three line burger on the top obviously if you're on a browser on your computer hit scene stories yeah so it's just like random stuff it could just it could be a paragraph about some some i don't know something that happened or it could be your view from an episode that you heard where there maybe someone was talking about a show or something that was happening and you were also there and you want to give your perspective that would be fucking great so you can email me the story include an image that you'd want me to put into the header image and then also just let me know exactly who you want me to credit so some people have just like written and hadn't said anything so i'm like you know where do you want me to link this to so i can give credit for writing this it could be like your website or I don't know, fucking whatever. If you'd like to support the podcast, you can go to thiswasthescene.com as well and go to store and buy some merch. I have a bunch of stuff up there. You can also donate as little as a dollar if you go to the thiswasthescene.com. I'm just sending you, just sending everyone to this website, which I'm very proud of because I, I just, I put this thing together a couple weeks ago and I'm, I'm pretty stoked on it. Uh, right at the top, there is a donate with a smiley face button. So click on that and you can donate some stuff. And um, if you like this episode, do me a favor, it's real easily in your app, just hit share and then take that link and share it to a friend through a text message. This helps get the word around because a lot of people are still just finding this podcast. So for instance, last week, there is a Twitter account called No Traps with an exclamation point. And uh, they wrote, Jesus, how did I not know about this was the scene until now? Double question mark. Listening to Trucker from Mohawk Barbie interview now, and it takes me back. He also enjoyed the Crazy Tom Martin episode, as did we all, I would say. Yeah, so sharing this anywhere or texting a friend or sharing online, it really just helps to get the word out because I don't really have any... I'm, I'm trying to put some ads to this thing, but I don't I don't really know what the fuck to target. I'm not good at that shit. So that helps. Thank you for in advance. You're great. I love you and all you do. Feel free to subscribe, leave a review, and share this with anyone who would love some nostalgia. With that said, let's get started. What's up, man? How's it going? It's good. So I say, do I say it as Sabatino? Yeah. I'm awful with names. I am so awful. Like, if you listen to a lot of these podcasts, if you listen to any of them, I will sometimes just not say someone's name because I'm like, 
I don't know how to say their last name, <laughs> so I just don't say it. I meet so I mean with the record label, I meet so many people that I I have to call people hey and hey you and hey guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's getting worse as I get older. Like I I it's even there was a there was some girl I hung out with last year. And we just like we like met at a bar or some shit. Or I was like at dinner and we started talking and even just like random things she was telling me the next day, I would be like, so is this? She's like, I already told you this. I'm like, oh <laughs> shit. <laughs> it's like, great. I'm completely skipping a, missing a step now. This is very fun. <laughs> All part of getting old, man. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So yeah, then he listening. So Scott uh, is Scott Wyden Kivowitz. He is in the North Jersey pop punk group on Facebook. So you should go join that. He interviewed me for his YouTube page and it was really fun. And then he hit me up. He's like, yo, man, you should get Neil Sabatino on the show. He was in Little Green Men, Stick Figure Suicide, Pensy Prep, which became my chem after he, uh, he left the band. My uh, and still fronts the Pheromonts, which is uh, his old band, and he runs Mint 400 Records. It used to put on many of the Hamilton Street and Bloomfield Ab shows. So I reached out to uh, Neil, and I was like, "Yo, man, I hear you have some interesting stories." And he wrote back, and he also talked about how you book shows in the Palace. So I was like, "There's so many cool things here to talk about," and it's interesting getting people on the show that some people might not know because, again, that's like you know some bands are known but if it's cool getting someone's perspective where i don't have we ever met uh i played with your your band with don't you have a band that had arcade in the title oh yeah arcade academy or uh, arcade academy arcade academy we played with fairmont played with arcade academy at brighton bar a while back holy shit could have been like eight to ten years ago. oh yeah that was a while ago i didn't Scott never mentioned, or he might have mentioned that, but I forget that. We played the Brighton Bar, I think, twice. Once we had Ryan Selleck, he was playing guitar. Oh, and, I know Ryan. Yeah, he was in the band for a minute, because he recorded two of our songs at his studio, his old studio at his mom's house. And He helped uh, Fairmont Records. Oh, did he? Yeah, he actually came out to like the middle of nowhere we were recording in this cabin. The very first time we decided to like self-produce and self-do everything... And he was kind of like our safety net. So he came and helped us like engineer everything just to make sure nothing went wrong. Um, Cause uh, Christian Casalo, who's in Fairmont was good friends with him. I think they worked together like in system administrations or something. Like that. Yeah. I remember was scars working with him at that time. I'm not sure. This might've been after that. Yeah. Cause they did a band together. Oh, God, I forget it. And there was, there was one song that was awesome it was about like robots or some shit and they put it out in like 2006 or 7 maybe um yeah i ryan was awesome at recording he did a really good job on our two songs and then he joined the band for like a minute and it just it wasn't his it wasn't his jam and i ran into him last year at the lane meyer humble show i was in the crowd during uh humble playing faith 98 and i'm jumping around and i bump into this guy and he's like oh hey man i'm like and I look at him, I know my face was like, who the fuck are you? I'm like, hey. And he goes, it's Selleck. I was like, holy shit. <laughs> I just didn't even recognize him. Yeah, I saw his band at the Loop Lounge a while back. And uh, when he was doing that, he was playing with somebody. And that's how we met him. And then, because, uh, uh, you know, through the mutual friend who was in the band, and then he offered to help us out with the record that we were kind of trying, the first record we were trying to kind of do by ourselves, which was 2010. Okay. And it worked out. He helped, you know, he helped us through the whole engineering process. It's kind of like scary the first time, you know, you're going off and like not using a producer or a studio and you're, we kind of bought all the stuff we needed and did everything ourselves, you know? Damn, that's pretty good. Did you find that you, it was worth it for saving money or whatever the, the real reason or like getting more control? Like, did it come out the way that you wanted it to? Uh, it was both. Cause we, so like when, um, like, in the 90s, I did a bunch of stuff to tape, and I always hated doing records like that because I felt like I had no control over that kind of stuff just because, you know, like, th there's not a whole lot of editing you can do. It's kind of, like, just performance-based. And then, like, in the 2000s, like, we started out doing records for, like, $100, like, a session, and then it slowly moved up to, like, we're moving up to doing LPs, and you're paying, like, seven, dollars $800, and then we wanted to get, like, more high-end producers, and we're you know, paying thousands of dollars. And like by 2007, 2008, we were paying like between five and $8,000 to do a record. And Jesus. I was like, yeah, 
I, I really want to do this for a long time and there's no way we can sustain this. So like our uh, Fairmont's 2008 record we did with this guy, um, Brian Russell, who worked at, uh, I think it's called Hit Factory in the city. And he, you know, he's like worked on like cold player records and big things like that. Wow. And uh, he, he's like Grammy nominated now and everything. So basically I kind of gave him the reins for the first record we did with him. I let him do everything from like pre-production all the way through everything. And we took a hundred percent of his suggestions. And then the next record, we kind of looked at what things we thought we could do ourselves after kind of learning a lot from him. And he was like ultra friendly and really gave us like in-depth looks at how to kind of do everything for ourselves. And I had always been producing a little bit, but um, not like was never like the person who was like 100 percent in control. You know, I always needed people to help me with some of the more technical things. Yeah. So. The next record we did after the one we kind of gave him the reins for, we engineered everything and then just went to him for vocals and mixing. And then the next record, the one that we ended up doing in a cabin where uh, Ryan came, we made sure we had like everything we needed. I bought Logic for my laptop and everything, got all the interfaces I needed, and we ended up um, just, you know, going out to a cabin in the middle of nowhere and doing like pretty much 100% of the record ourselves you know all the recording aspect of the record and then uh i think we brought it to the same guy brian russell to just mix it and kind of that was the my last like uh class on like you know how do you use compression on all the tracks how do you eq all the tracks oh, yeah. how should be eq'd and everything and by the next record we basically just jumped into it and did it a hundred percent ourselves like from engineering producing mixing mastering and like from then on, since like 2010, every record that Fairmont's done, we've done 100 percent ourselves just to kind of save money on it, you know. And like I've been doing it now since I started the label in like 2007. A lot of bands, you know, when I got better at it, started uh, coming to me for stuff. So I'm can, I'm interested how <clears throat> and we're going to definitely talk about the, you know, the late 90s. And I want to talk about the palace definitely because there's um. I just remember, I think a lot of people would be really interested in remembering that and then, you know, Hamilton Street and kind of stay in that, that time period. But I'm fascinated by, I always, it was always the dream in theory. I felt like a lot of bands when they started was going on tour, recording a record, then getting their van, you know, obviously before they wanted to go on tour. There are all these like milestones that were so exciting. When you hit them, you're like, when, you know, when you got a van, you pulled up to a show, you're like, yeah, we're getting out of a van right now. This is fucking crazy. But one of them was always going going somewhere. And I always hear bands being like, yeah, we spent six months or three months locked in a studio making this C- this record. And I was I was like, man, I wonder, I'm sure that it's stressful, but also cool. And then going to a cabin and doing it. I know that I talk to this band a lot, but I've heard like, I think it was Balance and Composure did that with two records ago. And then I think Whippersnapper they, yeah, they definitely did that with the last CD they put out where they just were like fishing every day and then recording <clears throat> and recording. So like was the process when you went and did that, like how long were you there and what did it look like on a daily basis? So we did 10 days um, and that was the max we could like really get out of work for all of us. So um, we did 10 days of tracking and we pretty much spent the full days once we woke up like from like 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. tracking, um, we we kind of like over tracked, you know, like we definitely didn't use everything that we ended up tracking, but we tried like different mic placements, different amps, different volume levels and things like that um, just to make sure we had everything because we were so nervous because we were doing everything for the first time, you know, mm-hmm. Um so, like, we did 10 days of tracking for our 2010 record um, and then kind of sifted through it once we got back to, like... Yeah, but what was it know? like on a daily basis, though? You know, oh, like, yeah, like, let me get, like, the behind the scenes, just a little, just sure. a little, like, snapshot of that. So the way the cabin was set up was there was, like, a living room, like, a, cent- a central living room area and there was like a, a bedroom with like bunk beds in it and it was really tiny and that was basically like our control room so all the computers all the monitors and like the the speakers and everything and all the wires were like running into that little bedroom so like the whole rest of the band would be hanging out in the 
like in the control room while whoever was tracking was tracking like in the main room. And we had to basically just like yell back and forth because it wasn't like a real studio where you had a window and you could even see them, you know. <laughs> so like we're yeah. like yelling. And I know we use some of the yelling back and forth like in tracks like you can definitely hear on um, that. Re- that record was called Destruction Creation. And it, like you could hear like in a couple spots, like people said, yeah, you know, like in ready, you know, or whatever, you know, like just in the backgrounds of cool. some of them. We thought that was kind of cool. But I mean, I mean, it was we were we we're very like work focused, like, OK, we're starting with with drums and, you know, like basically the drummer could get through everything with just me playing along so I was playing like direct in his ear and he was in the room and we just went through you know probably like two days of tracking all the drum stuff and did like you know three to five takes of every song and then like when that was all done you know and we were happy with it we you know cleared out the drum set and set up the keyboards or you yeah know, but what was up- it like yeah but what was it like when you guys were just like the oh, living right. situation you know where you guys was it well, fun? Was it like super late night? Did you guys, you know? Uh, we're we're like wusses, so like not ri- like we're and we weren't like partiers or anything. <laughs> like we we would uh, so it was like a cabin literally in the middle of nowhere. There was no internet. There was no like um, no TV, no anything. Like hard like there's barely electricity there. So we were like lighting a campfire, you know, when we like once it got dark out and we, you know, roasted hot dogs over the campfire, you know, had a couple of beers and then That's went awesome. to bed and did it all over the next day. And like pretty much like like I said, we were so nervous about like doing doing it the first time for ourselves that we over tracked everything and tried different mic placements and you know, different well, That's the whole tone. point though. I mean that's that's the whole reason why you had that yeah. time to sit there. Because there was usually when we would record anything, we would just plug it in and say, okay, this is the amp I'm using. Like, we never went through, I never felt that we went through, let's try a different guitar tone for this. And like, let's right. try different sounds or let's place the mic in, you know, a really far away from the drums and have that opening sound sound so far away. And then it kicks in. It sounds like it's in your face, you know? But, well, just working with like producers, I kind of saw how like, if you record just how you play live um sometimes like as guitars and different instruments get squashed through like compression like in a recording like it loses the dynamics that like a live watching a live like when a when a guitarist hits their guitar harder live it gets louder in a recording you kind of lose that so in order to like kind of make up for that we would do you know like a lot of overdubs and like like change tones so that you know in a chorus a nice bright jangly guitar might come in or something so like some of our tracks like on the on the previous records had up to like 120 tracks and once we were doing this like ourselves we were like crazy about that like overdubbing like different octaves of things and like different you know all all different layers of guitars kind of like layering in like fender guitars and gibson guitars because like the fender has better you know high end and the gibson had better like low end and then kind of meshing those two sounds to almost sound like this one great guitar that has like all the dynamics to it you know so like we fooled around with like a lot of stuff sonically like around the time because we could afford to then you know and we had started to do that with the previous records because we kind of always got project rates from the producers and they would let us kind of um do whatever we wanted to do for a certain set price you know yeah um so we were able to explore, but you know, when you're on your own, you have a lot more time, uh, you know, to explore because you're not paying for it, you know. I'm so fascinated that you're still doing music. Is this like so the label and the band? Is that completely the full time thing, or is that a side thing to a full time job? Oh, totally a side thing. <laughs> um, okay. So, yeah, that was I'm, like, I'm, how is this I'm, fucking guy making a living off of music in any sense? But I mean, like, yeah, the one percent or the five percent are making a living off of music, but for twenty years. But you know, like, yeah. um, I just, you know, like, I'm a, I'm a teacher, and I get out of work by like two thirty, and I have my summers off, and oh. you know, like, I have the time to do it, and like, it, it's like it's only gotten better over the years working with like higher level people and like kind of figuring out like the producing stuff myself like my own label like has all 
I don't know, it's kind of like, I, I wish I was doing this 20 years ago, you know, like now that I, I've, and like doing shows like at cool places that are like super indie friendly and like, just kind of like, I wish I was, you know, 20 years younger doing it like in the, in the scene that I've kind of created for, for myself through the label, you know? Yeah. I mean, it's like on, on your Facebook page, you've got what, two kids? Yeah. Two, two girls. Yeah. I'm impressed that you're, you've, I think a, a lot of people that I talk to are, I can't do this thing anymore because I've got this excuse, this excuse. And you're, you chose a career of how, you know, you're, that you wanted to do, but it also awards you time after. And some people would say, yeah, but I got to do all this other stuff, but you're still getting in that creative stuff in there. I am, I just am very Im- impressed by that. Well, my wife is amazing and allows me to do all that stuff. And, it's great. um, I do like, like as far as like, like local shows, for instance, like there's two shows a month that I run, you know, and like, that's also my wife's night that she can like, get out of the house and come to the shows and like hang out at a bar and we get a babysitter too, you know, like, so I do like a Jersey city show every month on uh, Tuesday at pet shop. And then I do stashes and Fairland like once a month. So that's not like crazy. And then like the only other times it gets crazy is like when you're, you're producing a band's record. But um, when I'm producing other bands, I kind of tell them, you know, I have a family, I have a wife, I have other responsibilities. We can only do this in like five hour blocks. So basically, like bands are coming to me to do stuff for the label, and I'm recording them for free for the label. Yeah. Um, but it's in five hour blocks. Like you, you like we're not going to block out five days where you're doing twelve twelve hour days. You know, if you want to do that, go to a studio, and I can help you mix it. But you know, you can't do that at my house. I have a family living here. You know, so <laughs> yeah. like. You know, so like the bands that, you know, they're getting a record for free and they're and they they have, you know, if they're picking me to produce their record, they obviously like what I've done on my own records and other records that I've produced. So like sometimes it takes a little bit longer for bands that are using me to finish their records. But I mean, like, I don't like there's bands that have, taken you know, like a month or two to get a record done. Um, and then I have other bands who like are in the same boat as me. They're older guys with families and responsibilities and they're coming to me only like four or five hours a week. Yeah. And it's taken a whole year for them to get their record together, which is fine because, like, with the label, I put out a ton of stuff. So I'm not, like, waiting on anybody. Like, whenever records get finished, that's when I, I slot them and get them out, you know? Yeah. Like, a lot of people think it's super busy, but I set up a really good system for the label so that it's, like, you plug a lot of stuff in and it just goes through the system of what we do, like, as far as radio, distro, and, and licensing and all that stuff. But, like, it's not... It is like a full time job. I probably do the label about eighty hours a week. Jeez. But you know, it it's my kids, you know, when they go to bed at seven o'clock at night or eight o'clock at night, that, that's what I'm doing for the next hours sometimes. Or, you know, when I'm getting emails, I'm immediately responding to those emails or doing you know, like I set aside specific times to get done what I have to get done for the label. So I usually like I'll go back like way back and talked about how people got into music, but I think with this I really you know, we were like we're like almost half hour in. I really wanna get into talking about like the scene and, and, you know, and that whole time period and what you saw and like what you were contributing. So initially, I don't think I was, really super into like smaller punk rock bands like i liked you know nirvana a lot and green day and like the bigger bands and then i kind of discovered you know oh you know there's these other bands that aren't quite as big as those bands like operation ivy the misfits and uh you know rancid and like stuff like that and i started getting into all that stuff in the like really early 90s and um actually i lived in i grew up in wayne and i used to go to flip side a lot where alan rapaport used to work and he, you recommend stuff to me and I would just go in that shop and spend every cent I had like on seven inches and cassettes and CDs and stuff and like buy a lot of stuff out of like the promo boxes and just check out like everything and like I think that's how I initially kind of got more into like punky stuff but I wouldn't say that I per se was specifically just into punky stuff like Fairmont's a very indie-ish band and I think that's what I was always into I just in the 90s I was mostly in punk bands that's kind of what my peers and people who are, I was playing with we're doing you know do you remember i mean alan has been mentioned he's been interviewed he was 
it's it, Alan was a very big part of I think a lot of people getting into music in New Jersey in the northern Jersey area but he had so many connections that even um, there's an interview coming out tomorrow with uh, the band Jill and that was the band from Texas that he had found and so he was like really good and then he was friends with Eric from Creep Records so he brought a lot of stuff to Jersey and it's just so funny that his name always comes up yeah like Pop Kid was definitely a gigantic inspiration to me starting a label because I was like you know this kid lives around the corner from me he went to the same high school as me you know like I think I was a freshman when he was a senior and he was like he was able to like put out seven inches and like do some really cool stuff with some like really like when I saw him he did like the ultimate fake book seven inch was like oh my god you know he got this really big band to do thing on his on his small label and I was just like blown away and like that's kind of when I I knew that if I figured out the right way to do it I could do a label also you know do you remember that you you mentioned before the the box the that random the promo box at, at Flipside and yeah I remember talking to Mike Pilak he was he booked a lot of shows at Wayne did you ever know Mike Actually, yeah, you must have, because you were friends with, because you were in Pen- Pensy Prep, and he's really good friends with Frank. I so when Pensy Prep was going on, though, when I left, Frank was only like nineteen, so he might have met him like after that, you know. Yeah, but Pilak mentioned that that promo box, and he said that's where he found the High Strung demo tape, and he goes, "That's what changed his life with music." Do, do you remember a specific album or tape you? put brought out of that box or like this was like one of the best things i found for free i just remember like like checking out like i would always ask alan like hey this is the kind of stuff i like what bands would i like and like i remember he turned me on face to face and like rancid and like like some of the the like like when green day put out their big record he's like oh did you know they have like three other things that are out before that you should definitely check those out so like i think i just i bought so much stuff like i don't know if it was just one band that changed my life i as far as like local bands though going to see local bands i remember when um when i first started talking to my wife she lived in minnesota and i lived in new jersey and she told me all about weston and how amazing weston was and if they ever came to my area i had to check them out and so, like, I remember one of the first bands that, like, I actually went out of my way to go see a lot was Weston. And I think I saw them every single time they came through from, like, 1993, to, you know, until, until like, 1998. Like, every time they played the Pipeline or, or Connections or wherever else they were coming through, you know, like, I was... Did you... I mean, so you saw that whole transition where it was Chuck and Dave were singing, and then Jim came in the band, and then Chuck left the band. So you saw, like, three iterations of that band. I did. And then I saw them towards the end uh, i booked them at the palace like closer to 98 99 when they were towards the end with like um yeah. that guy jesse and some other people and then i saw the repos and um like i actually uh so my wife was kind of good friends with dave and we ran into dave at post weston after weston had broke up and he was talking about how he's starting like a solo thing um and he wanted to know if he could get on any shows with my band because we were doing pretty well at maxwell's at the time in like the early 2000s so we started getting like Dave onto like a bunch of our shows solo. And then uh, he actually came on a couple tour dates with us, like through the Northeast and met a bunch of our friends. And then like asked if um, myself and the drummer of Fairmont, Andy Applegate, would be like, you know, basically his backing band for his solo project. And he gave us, he had this whole solo record done. And his solo record is by far my favorite thing that he's ever done. And I've begged him for years to please let my label put it out or please just put it out because it's amazing. But all I had it on was like a cassette and I've like ripped it to MP3 since and I go back and listen to it every once in a while. But so we were Dave's backing band for a couple of years and then he decided to like um, did the solo band hardcore for like about. I would say like a year we did a bunch of shows we played with jimmy's band at the time which was cordova and he was doing that like um pennsylvania somewhere and we played a couple pennsylvania shows we played with digger we played a couple things like that um and then dave kind of took a break from it and called us up one day like just out of the blue and said hey come play a show and it was like we hadn't practiced in six months and i'm like do you want to practice this in and he's like no no just show up and we'll do it and so we showed up and we did it and it was terrible and like well he invited this other guitarist uh, jeff kish um to play with us too who i don't think had he hadn't really even practiced with us hardly ever and so we just kind of winged it on stage and it was not good and then dave kind of was like yeah 
like fizzled pretty quickly. And then he like maybe a year or two later, he was doing the Weston reunions. Then he kind of gave up on the whole solo. I've heard. So sorry, go on. I was just going to say, like when I was at practice and stuff with him, also, he would like fool around so much and like just break out cover songs and stuff. And I felt like it was his band, but I was like running his practice. Like, okay, Dave, we got to go through these songs. <laughs> we got to get these done and like just make sure we know go out and play a show. So like I felt like he kind of needed the structure of being in more of a full time band. But his solo record, like I said, is one of the coolest things. It reminds me of like Chuck's interview where Chuck, towards the end, he goes, he's like, it's getting really serious in the band. And I'd come into a room and be like, what's this? And Dave would just look at me and go, meetings. <laughs> it just seems like it kind of defined what his attitude was to like, you know, being serious or like, you know, kind yeah. of honing it in to create something or make it grow. <laughs> well, the record was like so mature for him. It was like, it was definitely not pop punk. It was more like in an indie vein. And it was really it, like, if you like the Dave songs, especially towards yeah. the end, like Uninspired and that kind of stuff. This record is so solid and so good. Like I, like I said, I've begged him for years to like release it, and he just never wanted to do anything with it. It was like left in the like unfinished mixing stage, and basically that's what he gave us to like learn. So let me talk. About, I want to talk about like what was um, what was like the first show that you went to, first local show. I think it might have been Pipeline. I think it was Big Wig Ignite. And Plow United at the Pipeline was like the first smaller local show that I went to. Besides, like, I went to shows that like my friends' bands played wherever they play. And they were always, I don't know, they were like some kind of like crappy alternative rock thing. But like the first punk show I went to was probably like 1993, 1994. Ignite, Plow United, and Big Wig at the Pipeline. And from like then on, I was like going to like punk rock shows, like pretty much on a like maybe every, twice a week or on a week, at least on a weekly basis. And then is this the time that you started playing in the band? So I had picked up bass when I was 17 and I like grabbed a couple people and just started a band with barely knowing like how to play and just kind of threw together very punky sounding stuff. And then I switched over to guitar and it took me like three or four years to get anywhere near decent. So like my first band was just like a mess. We didn't even like play we didn't play like cool punk shows. We played like shitty bar shows in front of probably my parents and like two other fans, you know, like that was it. And then like around 1997, I joined little green men. And so little green men for a couple years was like a central Jersey band. And they were like more like alternative rock. And I kind of turned them into a punk slash Scott punk band. Cause that was my abilities at the time. And I was writing a lot of their music. Um, And so the lead singer of that band was the guy who actually found out about the palace and found this guy, Mark, who like owned the palace, uh, was going to let us book a bunch of shows there. And so, so like the first couple, I think the very first show we did at the palace was yeah. a 10 band show with big wig headline. And uh, I know Mohawk Barbie was on it. Nowhere fast LWL, like all the, all the locals. And I think we booked a lot of ska bands also like uh, one cool guy and all those bands like basically that was the only way my like little green men could get shows was if we were throwing the shows. So it was kind of necessity for us. So like we finally found like a cool spot to do the shows at and we figured out who the cool bands were. And then we started doing shows there on kind of a regular basis, but they always were like these 10 band marathons. I don't know. Hundreds of kids would come out no matter. I think the second show after that was like Doc Hopper. And then like with little green men though, like it was kind of like smaller bands and it wasn't till like, I joined Stick Figure Suicide that, like, I had gotten really good at, like, getting a hold of booking agents and things like that and, like, booking some slightly bigger bands. Like, um, 10 Foot Pole came through with Catch-22 and Digger, like, on a tour and Stick Figure opened up for that. And uh, the Bouncing Souls came through with, I think, Anti-Flag and we opened up for that. And, like, uh, I know Weston came through, uh, like, whatever was coming through through, like, particular booking agents that I was talking to, you know. I would try to get them to come to the palace like in those couple of years while I was doing, um, I think 97 to 99 was pretty much when I was doing the palace. And then, so 97, is that the show you, is that 97, the big wig show you were talking about? Cause I'm trying, I'm, I, I always talk about this in pretty much every interview. I always go onto North or the NJPP archives website and then I go do flyers. I was just that today. Cause I wanted to be able to give you some like info on exact 
dates or anything, but I like I was looking through it. There's one where there's a flyer where Josie and the Pussycats are on the flyer. I'm looking for that now. <laughs> we basically were putting on festivals all the time. Five dollar festivals. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> well, because we just had the bands playing like a half hour set, and we would run the shows from like I don't know, like four o'clock to ten o'clock at night, you know, and everybody yeah, would play a half it was, hour. Uh, that was. I mean, even then, I think we always joked about it. We're like, wow, it's you've got to have. Even like when someone new put on a show, it's like, well, you got to have like seven to ten bands because that's what everyone else is doing. You're like, no, make it maybe four or three. That'd be great. Well, we were always, we were just thinking like that's what you needed to do to get people in the door, you know. That first big wig show that we did had like close to 500 people at it. I mean, the only things after that that had that many people were like probably the Bouncing Soul show or the 10-foot pole show sold out. Then the pals became sort of old news. But people were still coming out, like a couple hundred people to every show. And we, like, I really loved uh, Nora Fast and Folly. Like, when they were, like, teenagers, I tried to book them all the time. And LWL and Mohawk Barbie were, like, my absolute favorites. And, like, I knew Stein really well. Um, Stein would actually hire me to, like, come to his house and press buttons for, like, for his business. He, like, sold buttons as a business. He had, like, a one that, like, had, like, a power like a power button presser thing like to make like you know pins for bands so like you would put the thing in and have like a like a have like an engine to it and like you would have to hit the thing and it would stamp down like the things and he just didn't have time to fill all the orders so he would hire me like when i wasn't working because i was had like part-time jobs or whatever so he would like hire me like part-time to make buttons in his basement which was pretty cool so is this one he would this is doing umbilical, right? Yeah, he was running umbilical, and I kind of like looked up to that too. As like, oh, this is like, you can run a small label. Like that was my aspirations when I started Min Four Hundred was just to be like, like umbilical or like Pop Kid or something like that, you know. So how? Like, give me kind of the like a, a behind the scenes of booking shows for the Palace. Like, what was that like, and what was the process? So that was actually awful, <laughs> um, because. Like you, you get into like the gritty business end of stuff and it really is is hard because like at the time Heath from you know XSDB was just starting up and he was like a teenager and I remember he called me up and said, Oh, can you give me some information on like booking shows? Like how do you do that? And how do you get in touch with bands and stuff and like do all that stuff? And I kind of gave him like a lot of my like trade secrets of like booking shows and going to what booking agents I was going to. And, like, pretty much right away, he, like, turned around and, like, was stealing shows that we were trying to get for the palace and, like, telling the booking agents that we wouldn't pay bands and things like that. And, like, then Ricky started booking shows and, like, they were kind of doing a similar thing, like, taking away all the stuff that we were bidding on, like, outbidding us by a little bit to, like, kind of take away shows. And then, like, bands would get, like, super angry if, like... You know, like some of the shows, like the bands, we always tried to overpay the bands. And, you know, once in a while, like the bands didn't draw enough to get kind of what they were asking. And like, I'm taking money out of my wallet to pay them, you know. And like, if I was even like $5 short, they're like, oh, you'll hear from our booking agent. We're going to sue you guys. And, and, you know, like it was like ridiculous things. And then like, I remember, um, I remember kind of like when it came to an end of the palace was uh, the band Guttermouth had played. And they were antagonizing kids, like, in the audience. And um, people, like, they just, like, they, it almost, like, got into, like, a fist fight between the band and people in the audience who were there to see other bands on the bill. And, like, and then, like, the, the show didn't draw well either. And it was just, like, kind of, like, my last straw with trying to do these bigger shows, you know, like, especially once I left Stick Figure Suicide, I was like, you know, I don't need the stress of, of doing shows. The only reason I was doing it was so my band could open for these like cool bigger bands. And like, so I like left booking the palace around then just cause I just needed to kind of take a break from all that. And, um, after stick figure suicide, like about six months later was when I got into Pensy prep. And, um, when I was doing Pensy prep, I wasn't really interested in booking shows anymore. So like we, just ended up kind of getting on cooler shows. Like, like we opened for Not a Surf at the um, at Loop Lounge, and we then we got them to play one of Ricky's shows actually. So I kind of patched things up with Ricky. Yeah, so it was like Adam and his package, Not a Surf prep, and I think one other opener, and it was great. It was so like super packed, and like it was really good for Not a Surf too, because we were kind of like 
friendly with them and we had played with them at Loop Lounge and nobody was there. Like 20 of our friends were there and there was nobody there for them. We said, you guys should like play some like more scene type shows. I think people would really dig what you're doing now because they kind of had become this like they weren't the band that did the popular song in the 90s anymore. By then they were kind of doing this really cool indie stuff that was kind of punky um, for the record that like the major labels wouldn't put out, which was called Proximity Effect. It was like their 2000, 1999, 2000 record that like uh, the label basically gave it back to them and said, you could do what you want with this. And I think they only released it in Europe. And then, um, so yeah, we got him on a show. It was a weird match because Adam and his package is just like a weird mix with Not A Surf, but it worked. And like years later, I ended up getting Not A Surf on a couple more shows at Hamilton Street when I started Fairmont and I wanted to play with them. So like I got Not A Surf on another show with Adam and his package. And uh, I, I don't know, it just worked out because like both bands were local and they were like the right price and drew the right amount of people to like be a good fit, you know, financially to do a together not necessarily musically um but with penty prep like i said we were we were like really focused on like writing the one record we wrote and like we then you know we played a show with the strokes i believe it was the night they got signed to their big label their big major label deal and we got to meet those guys and hung out with them and it was very cool um and it was like so with Pensy Prep, I was busy enough. I didn't like search out booking shows and we got on a lot of good hall shows and we played like CBGBs and like all the cool spots that we wanted to play. So we were too busy to like be booking our own things. Like we played um, in West Patterson at the, we got asked to play the hall over there that I think um, Antonio from Dharma Boys was like booking a lot and Red Rover played over there a bunch with us and bands like that. And then um, Pensy Prep basically went on a tour um i ended up getting kicked out of the band how wait how wait talk about this <laughs> <laughs> so he's everyone's favorite story so with Pensy I, want the, prep, I want the juicy gossip bro yeah <laughs> well so prep was frank who eventually went to my chemical romance was the lead singer and get uh like the rhythm guitarist i was the lead guitarist uh this guy john mcguire who later became known as hambone so a lot of scene people kind of know him as hambone early 2000s uh oh yeah Tim, i was on his um i was on his uh podcast uh last year yeah so uh he also ended up in fairmont like later on too but um oh so, uh and then this kid tim and sean simon who sean also was like uh sean was went on a bunch of tours later on with my chemical romance and helped they he kind of came up with the concept with gerard for the fabulous killjoys or whatever that record was called and okay. he does like comic and some comic stuff so anyway, that was the five of us. Uh, the th three of them were like 19 years old. I was like 23 and like one was like 21 or something like that. So everything was great until we decided, like we got on Eyeball Records um, after that Stroke show. Actually at the Stroke show was when we met one of the guys from Eyeball and gave him our demo. And shortly after was when we ended up getting signed. And um, we put together our record over the summer. We we went, you know, up to Nada Studios, record our record, and um, the plan is to like put it out with Eyeball, and we're gonna book like a like a four week tour ourselves. And so my wife um, was originally from Minnesota, and she was gonna let us kind of use her parents' house as like home base, and then we could like stay at her parents' house and then go out and play shows in basically the Dakotas and like Wisconsin and around Minnesota. And like kind of just come back to use that house, you know, her parents' house as like where we could stay in between shows and everything. So um, Hambone bought us our first van. Oh, wow. And like we, we had this gigantic yellow monster and like he, he <laughs> we ripped all the benches out and kind of reconfigured so we could fit all our gear in. And that we there was like like basically almost like beds to sleep on. Uh, one of our friends was going to come out and um like drive for us so that we could do like all night drives and make these crazy drives and like i had not really booked a tour like a, a like a 20 date tour up until that point and so like we would put like my wife on the phone with like a british accent pretending to be our booking <laughs> agent <laughs> like, like have like a good show set up at like seventh street entry in minneapolis which was like great room that like the replacements played and we really wanted to play there we had a chicago show we had um yeah. like booked in like um 
I think we played Ohio on the way out. We had some stuff in the Dakotas because we had one of our friends had a cousin in North Dakota. So like it was it was shaping up and we had enough dates to like like get out there. And then Eyeball helped us set up the very first show of the tour, which was with Thursday and Shady View Terrace at the Loop Lounge. Wow. So we go out and we play the first show. Everything's great. Packed house. There's like important people there and they say we're like awesome. And this is like even the owner of a label Time Out was like, oh, you know, you guys are so much better than I thought you were going to be because he had heard the record and he thought we were just way better than the record. And we were also playing songs that were written after the record. So I think it was that night that the van broke down just on the way to the loop lounge. <laughs> So we have to get the van into like the mechanic and uh, I forgot what went wrong with it, but I think it was leaking gasoline or something like that. And the mechanic told us, don't worry about it. You should be fine to get to Chicago. And then so I think the next in the next two days, we had to get out to Chicago and we drove like or the next day. I think we were playing in Darien, Illinois, like kind of by Chicago. And uh, we had to drive all night. And so, like, we're driving all night, bands flicking lit cigarettes out the window as they're, like, smoking. And then, like, when we get to Chicago, we realize that the van is really leaking gas like crazy. Oh, my God. So, like, we had to get it to a mechanic. So we're playing the show while our van is at the mechanics. And, like, pretty much this van was, like, what broke up Pensy Prep. Because, like, every single state that we were in, that van, like, broke down in every single state. <laughs> I'm remembering now we also went down to St. Louis for that because that that was like the final one of the final straws of like the van breaking down. So we we finally get out to Minnesota. We like and I was a bit nervous, you know, because I'm meeting my wife's parents for probably the second time only. Um, This was when we were boyfriend, girlfriend, you know, we were just starting to date. Yeah. So we're you know, we're, we show up to her her parents house and. The, the immature, like, 19-year-olds are, like, kind of just, like, saying a lot of stuff under their breath, making a lot of inside jokes and saying things like that. I'm like, guys, just, you know, can you stop? And, like, they kind of got pissed because I was, like, you know, like a wet towel on their on their good time. This was, like, the first time all of them were getting away from home, you know? Yeah. And I was in, like, a dad, like, guys, can you just, like, chill out? Can you just go and, like, go hang out in that room? Don't, you know, don't talk to my in-laws, my future in-laws at all. And, like, <laughs> they pissed because I was, like, you know, super nervous being there. So like that started the fighting. Then I think the seventh street entry show, we were like 10 minutes away from my, my in-laws live in Fairmont, Minnesota. We were 10 minutes away from Fairmont on our way up to Minneapolis, probably the best show of the tour we're going to and the van breaks down. So I just remember that the van broke down in this small town called Medelia and I was like super pissed at Hambone because I'm like, how the fuck do you buy a van that is like this big a piece of shit and make us go halfway across the country in it? So I was just like losing my shit already. And it's only like day two or three. And we, we had to cancel the Seventh Street Entry show. We're sitting at the mechanics. And I just remember the bill came out to 666. And I was like, fuck, we're fucked. Like, that's that's just a bad omen. Like, we finally get the van fixed and I'm able to rebook a show like somewhere in the middle of Minnesota, middle of nowhere. Cause one of my wife's friends knew somebody. So we go and do this shitty bar show. And I think some drunk yelled, get off the stage. And then the drummer starts in, I'm not playing here. You know, like fuck this guy, this guy's yelling at us to get off the stage. And I'm like, just finish the show. You know, they're going to pay us a hundred bucks and we really need the money. So just finish the show. And basically we get into a cursing match on stage. <laughs> I'm um, cursing with like the keyboard player and with the drummer who had never really been in bands and had never really done this at all and didn't realize you're going to have a lot of shitty shows throughout your career. So I felt like it was a little bit like babysitting. And then the whole band feels like it's, you know, me against the band. And like, we're, we're just like kind of not talking to each other. We get to another basement show up in the Minneapolis area. I think it was like St. Cloud and the keyboard player wouldn't get out of the car and go watch one of the other bands that was hosting the show for us. And I was like, dude, you got to come inside and like watch the band like that's hosting the show for us. And it was just like immature shit like that. So like the band got tired of me, like, you know, being the dad of the band. The I think we got to the Dakotas. OK, got through that show and it was good. And or I might be mixing this up, but I know we went down to St. Louis at some point. 
And in St. Louis, the van broke down again. And we barely rolled up to a mechanic station as the van just completely died again. And luckily, like Hambone's dad, I think, kept forwarding us, like giving us money or permission to use his credit card to like get this van back on the road. So I, I'm not sure if we had to cancel a show or not, but we just we had had it by then and we were all fighting and miserable and it was hot in the van and like we're three weeks in now and like haven't had you know we had a couple good shows but also a couple rotten shows and um i think we were heading towards our last show of the tour in columbus ohio and it was at this place called bernie's distillery and i just i ended up playing there like years later and it's always been awful like we walk in and there's all these like homeless people at the bar and like they're definitely not interested in hearing music they're just there for like the cheap booze and so, like, there's nobody on the floor at all. All the other bands on the bill had canceled. So we're a touring band from nowhere near there. We're playing to nobody. And, you know, like, it, it just was like a miserable end. And we just kind of go home defeated. And I think at that point we were still okay. But then one of our friends was kind of just asking, so how'd it go? How'd every, how was everything? Tell us everything about the tour. And I think the keyboard player kind of vented about me you know, and what a dad I was being and how I was, you know, overbearing the whole tour and everything. But I, you know, I was handling all the business end of stuff. So I was, you know, I was kind of feeling a lot of pressure with it. So then I kind of just went off on him and I'm like, you know, like I, I had to be the dad because you guys are so, you know, irresponsible and like, I'm the only one doing the business end of stuff and it wasn't a vacation. And, you know, so we basically got into a huge fight and the band, you know, me and him had it out and we basically told the band it's either it's one of us or the other. You know, we both can't be in this band anymore. So <laughs> they basically didn't like what I had to say about him and said, see ya. And I was ready to kind of move on, too, because I had written all these songs that they didn't want to use anyway. So like that's I basically that week, basically within hours of them kicking me out of the band, I already had was calling up studios to go lay down the first Fairmont like EP as a solo acoustic thing. And it was a lot of songs about them, <laughs> like, of course. <laughs> so, like, I away, wrote an eight-song, like, acoustic EP. And, like, I think within four days of getting kicked out of Pensy Prep, had the first Fairmont EP. I sent it over to Reinforcement Records, who I had always been friendly with. They had helped with the Stick Figure Suicide record along with Umbilical. And I said, would you release this and put out a CD for me? And they said, yes, we would love to. And, like, I kind of started working with Reinforcement from then on for, like, the first three or four years of Fairmont, they were basically pressing our CDs and doing everything. You know, they were our label. Um, and that's kind of like how Fairmont got started. Pensy Prep kind of did a couple songs after that, but really kind of fizzled. And I think their, the drummer quit like maybe six or seven months later. And that was around the time Frank got asked to join My Chemical Romance as a second guitar. So he kind of went off and did that. Hambone got asked to join Sleep Station at the time, so he went off and did that. And, like, the band kind of just disbanded overnight. And um, we had only put out that um, one record, Heartbreak in Stereo, which there was renewed interest in then around 2004 because My Chemical Romance was getting so big. Yeah. And eyeball, without telling anybody in the band or... Uh, paying us anything decided to just repress it and start getting it out there and was selling them like hotcakes which is a whole separate story that i'll oh, leave so for when date. you do 2004 to 2008 podcast <laughs> <laughs> was this the heartbreak and stereo record yes yeah because i've seen i'm online right now the, um who did the artwork for that just so random but it's pretty cool i actually did the artwork for that I so like that. It's interesting because we fought a lot with Eyeball because I had this awesome picture of a robot hanging in my kitchen that I really loved that I had done. And we were pretty adamant that we wanted that to be the album cover. And um, like like the, uh, the Get Up Kids record, Something to Write Home About, had just come out and it had yeah. a robot on the cover. So Alex from Eyeball was like, no, no way, you're not doing that. Just find something else. So... Like I came up with like four or five designs and that was the one the band liked the best. But a lot of my dealings with like eyeball towards the end of that were also kind of why I decided I wanted to start a record label that was a little more fair to the artist and where it was somebody who was like an actual artist on the label that like cared about the bands. Because like towards the end of it, when like I basically called him up and said, you know, I don't really want to leave Pensy Prep. If you could talk to the guys, I would really love if, if we could just like make this work and 
he basically turned around and just threw more fuel on the fire and basically told me to go fuck myself and wouldn't help in any way. And like basically wanted me to have no connection to Pensy Prep. And he got rid of those records as quickly as he could and then turned his back on it until later Frank joins my chem and then there, and you know, there's good interest in the Pensy Prep record. Because at first he said, I'm never repressing that record. I'll never see the light of day again. You, you, you know, that record is done and over with. So don't call me up and ask me about it again. And he was like, just... You know, like I've had bands on my label where like there's been a breakup and then I've done a, a project with each of the songwriters who went their separate ways. And like there, you could, I don't know, there's just a much better way to handle things. And like Eyeball was like the worst at like, and from what I've heard on the business end, they kind of also followed the victory records model. Of- I was just going to say, I was like, it sounds again, like I know nothing about Eyeball. I know, I remember, I, I think I might've met Alex. Um, I always heard he was like a, pretty big dude like jack dude and he was like kind of intimidating is that true he was intimidating but he wasn't jack but i mean we had seen things like um he had broken up with a girlfriend and uh at one of the shows that we were at he spit on her and walked away and and like my wife was like you shouldn't be on this label this guy's an asshole and like there was an i we were at another like there was a pensy prep show we were doing like a just so like a show to kind of it was like basically five to 10 of our friends at this small restaurant in Clifton. And we were, it was kind of like to get ready for tour. And we just wanted to play in a space that wasn't our practice space. And one of our friends was standing up at the front of the stage, kind of like singing along and clapping. And Alex ran from across the room with a chair and just rammed the chair into the back of his legs. And like, and we're like, what the fuck? Dude? Like the guy was just like, had something wrong with him. And like, I don't know. I, but I like a mixture of like Victory Records and like Suge Knight. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I did a lot of work for him in the summer while I was on Pensy Prep. You know, like while I was in the band, and like he's just he's he wasn't he was more interested in like just the control of being the head of a record label than actually running a successful record label. Okay, interesting. So, weird. Um, and I don't care if he hears this because he's one of my least favorite people on earth. <laughs> It's Don't. amazing. Just let it all out. <laughs> oh, so anyway, I get out of I get out of uh, Pensy Prep. Then um, Mark, who owned the Palace, starts Hamilton Street. Okay. So Hamilton Street was cool because Fairmont was not very good. Like I was still figuring out how to sing, and I was still figuring out what kind of band we wanted to be. And I had like a revolving cast of people coming in and out. So. I basically had to like beg Mark to let me do shows there so that we could get on some bigger shows. So I did some stuff with Not a Surf there. I remember True Zero, Ari from Lifetime's band came through and we played with them. Zero Zero, Zero Zero. Zero Zero, that's it. Yeah, yeah. sorry. True Zero's the other. <laughs> yeah, it's like that Alan's band. It's like, wait, did they go together and they got Ari from Lifetime in it? <laughs> You're right. It's, and then um, we played with Ted Leo there and a couple other things. Like we tried to wow. always, like basically whoever, whatever booking agents I was working with, whatever other cool indie bands they had, I would try to like get to do shows there with Fairmont. And um, then he also got Bloomfield Ave Cafe rolling. Um, and he was like a part owner in that. So that was closer to where I live. So I like wanted to definitely kind of transition and do stuff up there. And I was, I tried to do some like bigger shows up there. Like um, I think I did a Ted Leo show at Bloomfield Ave Cafe on like a Tuesday night and like a hundred people came out. And, like, the guarantee was, like, I don't know, a little steep for Bloomfield Ave Cafe. And they got really mad at me that only 100 people came out. And, like, Mark had never really yelled at me or, like, ever gotten down on me, like, for the draw or whatever. Because I did so many different things for him. But I guess the part owners of Bloomfield Ave Cafe were a little stricter and kind of wanted to see a certain, like, quota above, you know, what, what, you know, they were paying the artists. So, like, I kind of, like... Once I start, I did a couple shows at Bloomfield Ave Cafe, and that's kind of when I stopped booking for a really long time until like more recently, until I like started the label. But I, I mean, the, the shows were always cool. I didn't like Bloomfield Cafe. I, I we played a show in 2005. It was a it was like the first Lane Meyer reunion, and we played there. And the next show was at Hamilton Street, and I didn't like Bloomfield. I just, I just thought it was just like this dark, shitty place. I mean, at the time, though, for, if you're living in North Jersey, like there wasn't a lot of scene friendly type places. To play. I think like, that's why. Actually, I think that might be why, because when we played, it was just in my f- it was so clear to me how 
to I felt like how dead the scene was. Yeah. And it was just a di- I mean for come it, there was a there's always a scene, there's always a music scene, there's always people, but the the energy was just gone. Like from the late 90s, like the early 2000s right when it before it flipped over to the Taking Back Sunday brand new era or whatever. And I felt like the energy, like you said, there would be 10 bands on a show, the place would be packed with kids. And then, you know, we all grew up and we stopped going and the 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 kids coming behind us, they just weren't for whatever reason they weren't caught they weren't you know catching on to what we had where some of them did but there was just like a huge portion of that and so when we played bloomfield i just felt like man this is just gone yeah uh, that was kind of how we were feeling too and like at that time then like i kind of was like blacklisted because of like the eyeball thing and having a big falling out with them. And they were kind of doing a lot of stuff in North Jersey. So like, I kind of just got the hell out of town. Like oh, that's wow. when I started taking my bands and like going up to like new England and out to Pennsylvania and playing New York and just trying every other area and staying away from Jersey and like touring more. And like, that was really when I like started probably like by 2005, 2006 Fairmont was doing like a hundred shows a year and probably only like 10 of those were Jersey. So we were just trying to like get the hell out of the area just because we felt like also we were mellowing out. I wasn't doing punk rock anymore and there wasn't, you know, there was a good scene coming up in New Brunswick and Asbury for like punkier stuff. But it just, you know, wasn't something that I fit into musically. And I was also getting older and I felt like by the time I was in my mid 20s, I felt like I was too old to be hanging out like at basement shows with like college age kids. So I just kind of moved on from that and like just got out of the area and like figured out you know what the band was about and like where we fit in you know what was the zine you wrote to me i also did a zine from 98 to 99 i'm kind of jumping yeah. over the place but this this is interesting to me you called it when um when i'm on fire i burn and yell things like ouch and help me i'm on fire <laughs> or help i'm on fire that's that is amazing that was just like a art zine that i basically did with my girlfriend at the time and uh the bass player of stick figure suicide wrote poems so we just wanted like a cool little outlet for my artwork, my girlfriend's artwork and for um, for the for Keith's poems. So like we just kind of um, got enough advertising to pay for the zine, like from just local places that we knew or like connections that we had and like charged very minimal amounts for the advertising. Um, and I think Alyssa Cohen, remember her? Well, What's she had like a, a name like Scottis or something like that. No. She used to she used to do like interviews for us with bigger bands because she knew like a bunch of bigger bands. So there's like little interviews with like the Get Up Kids and like bands like that in the zine. And we basically would ask them what they would do if they were on fire and <laughs> <laughs> like things like stupid questions like that. And it was, like, one little thing we did a couple issues of, and we did like a thousand copies, and we just gave them out at the palace. So like. Um, but I, I also did a bunch of re- like album reviews of like all the local stuff that I had, like, cause I was getting tons of CDs because of, um, you know, booking shows. So everybody was sending me their CDs. So like on, like unapproached, I would just take a handful of CDs and review like 10 CDs in each issue. But we only, because it was expensive and I had to get advertisers. I think we did it for three months in a row, did like 3000 copies, you know, <laughs> like, wow. and then we're like, I can't keep getting advertising for this. It's like becoming a full-time job to get advertising for this. Like Pinball advertised with us and a couple of the other local labels. And it was cool. What did they pay we, you? What did they pay you when they were advertising? Probably like 50 to 100 bucks for a full page or something like that. Oh, shit. That's pretty good. And we, we only needed like 300 bucks to do the whole zine. That's pretty good. I, I've heard that a lot, actually, that even, uh, even now I was listening to, I think, like the Tim Ferriss podcast, and he... I guess like getting advertisers is a giant pain in the ass. You, you know, it's... Well, because after you do three issues and like say it's three months later and they've just paid you for three issues in a row, they're like, OK, we need to take a break because, uh, you know, we, we've put out we've given you like 300 bucks in the last three, three months. So like, yeah, we'll, we're good for a little while. And then like, you know, so if the people who you're counting on can't do it, then you have to like go on a search for new advertising. There wasn't like a ton of local labels to ask. So like, or a ton of local music related people to ask without kind of turning it into a full-time job and like doing cold calls and like going out to music stores, you know? So like, yeah. I just didn't have the time, you know, to like keep it going, but it was fun for, and I also kind of got all the artwork out that I wanted to get out in those 
three issues, like I pretty much put like everything I had new for like the last, like, you know, like a year's worth of artwork appeared in those three issues. So like I was for a while. Yeah. It kind of dawned on me the other day that this podcast is almost like a digital zine in a way. I mean, it, it's very time consuming to and you'll be do this. Doing the guy who sold candy at pa- the palace or, <laughs> and what? you know, you'll be interviewing like the bartender at the loop lounge or, you know, like when you run out of people eventually. <laughs> yeah. It's like, it's funny. Like, a lot of people say that, but, um, there's Christ, man. I mean, if I'm only putting out like one a week and I take a couple weeks off here and there, that's like maybe 50 something interviews a year. It's amazing how some just bounce off to another one. Like the, the couple of weeks ago, I did a buddy head interview. I never, that wasn't even on my radar to do that interview. That's cool. Yeah. yeah, and it was just so much fun. But uh, yeah, it's um, if I had to like sit here and print all this stuff out and then just hand it out to people, <laughs> I'd go fucking insane. <laughs> that yeah, I mean that was part of the issue too. Is like we did three in such a small amount of time, and having like a thousand issues to give away only at palace shows, which I was doing at the time, was just you know I I think it took like more than a month to see a thousand people through shows so like we were just yeah. putting them out too quickly you know maybe it should have been like a two time a year thing or something and yeah that's pretty aggressive man like a thousand copies that's uh yeah. that's a lot well there was a price break that's why we did it oh okay so we're like, I guess we're doing them you know <laughs> like that many i mean the same thing happened with cds too though like when i was doing the early days of fairmont like we did a thousand to two thousand cds at a time because of the price breaks like and um you know, it took us a long time to sell 2,000 CDs. I mean, we were actually selling them, but it took like a year and a half to sell like 1,000 or 2,000 CDs. Damn. One thing I want to say, I do remember in the 90s at the Palace that either either Sean from Lanemeyer hated me or I hated him, but I can't remember what we got into an argument about, but I, I definitely booked you guys at least once or twice at the Palace. Okay, so we... <laughs> I, I don't know that. I know that Sean had... I don't know. He had like you know, or he had butted heads with people. As um, that was just like Sean's style, which it's so funny because Sean's like Sean's such a good guy, but like he was. What happened? What, like me and him have talked about this a lot lately because we we hadn't talked for a few years, and then when I, me and him connected a couple of years ago, and then, um, then like playing the show last year and doing the like the interview with this, like we got really close again, and we've talked about it, and I was like, man, you know, through these interviews and talking to him. The amount of stress that was on this dude to make this happen was so great that I think that that poured over into his communication with anybody where it was band related. And I have a feeling that that was probably, if that was the case, it probably happened. Because I do remember the show that we played. We played once, I believe, at the Palace. And it was right after we finished recording If There's a Will, which is our last CD. Okay. Or, or it was like before we started recording, but we we had just uh, wrote the second song on that CD, which this is funny because the only we played that song once, and the only show we ever played that at was the Palace show. <laughs> nice. We, we got up, I think we opened with it, or we played it second, and we we're like, oh, here's a new song. We played it, and it was just dead silence, and we were like, we we're we were like, we're never playing that fucking song again. <laughs> And we still have it, like to this day. Like we will never play that song again. But that was ha- that happened. That show was like after the big uh, rainstorm, wasn't it? When the whole town flooded. No, I th- oh I forgot. I know that once I left Stick Figure, I really didn't do any palace shows. So like, I think I left around the beginning of two thousand. Stick yeah. Figure, like around February two thousand. So that I definitely didn't do any shows after like that point at the that was that summer wait hold on yeah so that was before because i was i remember oh wait, no that went in there was i fucking forget when that storm hit but like Boundbrook was literally like yeah. a giant fucking lake at, for like a while or like a day but it just the whole town was just fucked wasn't it yeah i i i because i was from north jersey so like i like when that happened, I pro- that was either the end of me booking or I didn't book till like way after when they got everything like fixed up. Um, I know I was doing stuff pretty regularly there. Like at some point I was doing two and three shows a week um, for Mark. And then like I just was like, I can't do this anymore because like I was running out of like bands to book that would draw. And I was like, do you want me to just fill up the nights with like just random bands? Like 
and he didn't want me to. So like, it was just really hard. And like the, the locals that drew could only play there so much, you know? Yeah. That was also like that. They had the, that was the, the club also had that giant staircase going upstairs, right? Yeah. Yeah. That and I remember, um, like, uh, so, like, we, I would get a bad name for throwing shows, though, with, like, I remember, um, like, Big Wig was playing one time, and, like, I was standing in the back of the room with the owner, and, uh, and I, I hadn't even, I didn't even say anything or gesture or anything, and Tom yells from the stage, well, I know Neil and Mark want to go home, so we're going to wrap this up, and I was like, I don't want to go, I don't, like, just, like, shit like that would get said, and it would, like, you know, you're in a band, so you want to, like, put out a good image too but then you have like bands saying things like that or like bands yelling at you about money or things like that you know so like I, like i didn't really want to be on that end of stuff while i was doing like stick figure and pensy prep so like that's kind of why it had to end i just wanted to play in a band and not like most of the time whenever i was booking my hardest was when my whatever band i was doing was awful and i had to book shows because otherwise we wouldn't be playing good shows you know yeah so it's you- like when I was doing okay, I didn't need the book shows, you know. How do you feel that the like the vibe is now? Because I mean, you you know, you go back in this interview and you're saying that you saw Weston in like '93 is pretty much where you started seeing shows, like the Pipeline and all that, and till present day. So you've been and then like in, like you've been involved in the scene or a music scene since then because you you know still have the label playing music. Like, wh- what do you see like? How does it look now, a day is, like, doing this? It got really, like, there was a really bad period when, like, Maxwell's, when Maxwell's around, was around, was awesome. That was, like, our haven. And, like, yeah. there it shows, like, three and four times a year at Maxwell's. And then we would, in between that, do New York City and do Loop Lounge and whatever else was around. And, like, venture to, you know, the Court Tavern and Asbury and wherever. Um, like that was a cool scene in that Hoboken had, and there was like a really good thing going. And then that closed. And for a couple of years, we were trying to figure out like, cause I had started the label by then when that was closing and we're trying to figure out like, what do we do now? Like, where do we do shows? And like, I had a warehouse that I tried to do shows at. Um, I did one successful show there. Then by the next show, it was so successful that the cops and the fire department were there waiting for us to unload. And they said, you can't do shows here anymore. Like, this isn't zoned for this, and you can't have people coming onto this property. And won't. so, like, okay, next plan. So then, like, we moved to Jersey City, and we were doing stuff at the Iron Monkey, which was just, like, a restaurant, like, that cleared their tables out at, like, 9 o'clock on a Friday night. And, like, oh, you God. would have a floor that would hold, like, 120 people or something like that. And then that owner opened up a little venue next door to the place that was, like, kind of, like, a smaller 50-person place and we were doing stuff there for a little while and then the lamppost popped up which was cool and uncle joe's was around in jersey city so jersey city started to become like the hub for my label and like a lot of the bands i started to like deal with were from jersey city like the first bands i signed were um the first bigger bands were any day parade and um the one and nines who are both like jersey city bands and um like From there, Jersey City, like, went through a lot of changes, but now they finally have, like, a couple good venues. And, like, um, like Pet Shop does regularly, like, weekly free shows. FM is, like, more paid shows. And then, like, White Eagle Hall is, like, the bigger stuff. Like, basically, Todd from Maxwell's is at White Eagle Hall now doing, like, the bigger indie shows, like, there. So, like, there's a good scene in Jersey City, and there's, like, more bands because there is a scene And um, then I started doing stuff over in Fairdalon and like being able to invite a bunch of bands. And it's really like low pressure, like Mm because it's a small place, like an 80 person place. And like we invite five bands out and the owner, like if there's five bands worth of people drinking, the owner's happy and he pays us some money. And like he's he's happy with that. But usually we get a really awesome crowd every single show. And like it's a mix of like bands that are in their 20s all the way to bands that are in their 50s. People come out for the stuff as long as you put like quality bands on the shows. I've noticed like people come out. Also, free helps like when stuff is free. And now we're like branching out into New York and Asbury and like different spots. But anybody who says there's no scene just isn't like you know you try. Like, 
get older and they're not looking to go see local bands anymore. But there's a lot of there's so many more bands now and so many good bands. Like it's not often I run across like a lot of the amateur hour terrible high school type bands that like when I was booking shows in the late nineties that I ran into, you know, like I had to really curate those shows because there was a lot of terrible stuff along with great stuff. Like now it's a lot of really great bands usually. Do you do you find that there's bands that were from then that like you know like you said when you started Paramount like you were still trying to figure out your voice and sing and then you you know finally got there you know and then did you find that there's bands that you see now where years ago they started and you're like oh and now you're like holy shit this is wow good good job for sticking with it yeah I mean like that's kind of what I do with the label is look for potential like bands that I can develop and bands that I hear something in and I'm like oh this is you know, they have th- these couple things wrong, but these are all very fixable things with, you know, if somebody just tells them these are, you know, kind of the things that they're doing that aren't great. And like a lot of our bands, like that's what we end up signing. If you listen to them from like record one to record three, there's like enormous growth, you know, there. So like that's kind of what I'm doing with the label. And yeah, like there's tons of bands that like, you know, when I saw them in the early 2000s, if they're still around and then like, you know, or different people start different projects and like, you know, the one project may have been because they were trying one style of music um, as opposed to another. Like a, a good yeah. example, like Paul Rossevere from um, he was in Ready Made Breakup for years, which I like Ready Made Breakup, but I didn't go you know crazy for Ready Made Breakup. And then he started the Vice Rags and it was kind of like a little more replacements and like punky. And I really loved it and signed it to the label. So like there's a lot of bands that kind of do that kind of thing, you know, like where they they kind of switch styles because you know the other style wasn't working for them you know yeah no that's crazy it's, i'm just i'm just so fascinated that you just stuck with it just for purely just loving it yeah you know i mean also, fairmont was so bad in the early days <laughs> like like and then we finally like we put years in of like making everybody in the band just improve. Like I finally took vocal lessons around like 2005 and like made the drummer start playing to a metronome and made the bass player take bass lessons. And like, we all just got like so much better. And then from then on, like whenever we were getting new members, we were able to get higher quality members because we were all performing at a higher quality. So like, if you go and listen to like our 2005 record compared to our 2008 record, it's like night and day difference. Like I can actually sing on the 2008 record and like, you know, like, it, it's just, like, the songs are better written. They're more fleshed out. Like, working with different producers kind of gives you a perspective on that kind of stuff. And now, like, I just feel like I have, you know, a lot of records left to write and a lot of stuff left to say. So, like, I want to do that. You know, and I, I don't, I'm not really hung up anymore on the making it thing, you know? Like, which, when in the early days when I was younger, you're just so obsessed with, like, you know, especially being in a band with, like, Frank, who goes off and joins My Chemical Romance, and you see they have like major label success, and you're just like pining over, oh my god, he's having, you know, they're having major label success, and I can't fucking, you know, get ten people to the loop lounge, you know, like, and so like, you know, now I finally like hit my stride of like writing decent records, playing these shows that people are actually coming out to see us and like the music, and like, you know, like I'm 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 good with that. So like now I'm having like the time that I wish I was having back, you know. 15 and 20 years ago, you know? Have you noticed that... I, I, I have to wrap this up because I do have to get back to the work day. Um, but do you... Have you noticed in the last year there's been a bit more people coming back out? Because I feel like there's been... You know, it's been more open where people are kind of getting back into talking about this time where I'm like, are they now going out to shows more because they're talking about it? I think a lot of... like. I think when people have the time in their lives, you know, like once they've raised kids or done whatever and they have the time to like do a band again, that's when you're seeing like some of the older bands come back out again, you know? And um, that's a really like cool thing because usually it's like, like when Weston did their reunions, I thought they sounded so much better than like some of the earlier days when I saw them. And like when bands are ready to kind of get back together and do that kind of thing, I feel like it's like out of passion and like they just, you know, they usually have their shit together and are able to do a really cool thing, you know, when they're really ready to do it again, instead of like kind of forcing it and trying to make it. So, I mean, I don't, I don't know if I see more old bands coming out. I think like for me, since I've just been doing this the whole time, I guess I see the same amount of stuff. I am seeing more and more 
labels, which is cool because like now there's there's a lot more small labels than there used to be and bands have options to get signed to these labels and they're all really helpful, productive labels that are signing small bands and helping them develop, which is really cool. And like we kind of have like, you know, we try to do a lot of joint shows with those labels and like really help our artists play really cool events you know a couple of years like we partnered with this label called sniffling indie kids which are like much younger bands and younger guys than me and like we kind of just like our bands always really meshed well together and we started this thing called the north jersey indie rock fest and it was like at this gigantic like closed down church the first two years that we did it and we did like a festival with 10 bands on each floor and then like the next year we did it at the church again and it grew exponentially bigger and then last year we did it at white eagle hall and it was great um and like uh we're putting the North Jersey Indie Rock Fest on hold right now just because it was only labels involved. So it was small labels showcasing their bands. We're going to do something slightly different this year where it's a little more open to other artists coming in. But it's going to be the same kind of thing at like a multi-stage festival at like a um, a pretty big venue uh, later on. This year. It's just like I think the, the uh, there was like that high strung lyric. Do you remember high strung? I do. Was that I'm... Jeremy? Yeah, it was Jeremy from uh, Humble and Sticker and Big Wig and Near Miss and Jeremy, Jeremy, and uh, all his um, bands. I played with him with one with either Pensy Prep or, um, or with uh, Stick Figure. I, I think we played with everybody. Probably, yeah, <laughs> definitely with Stick Figure. I mean, I, def, I, I could imagine it being more with Stick Figure because they. That's when it's high strung. With Jeremy quit the band in like '98, I think it was. Not gonna, but there was like a, a lyric. I think he, I think it was he, I think it was Jeremy. It was like, "Got to keep the scene alive." <laughs> it just kind of popped in my head as you're telling me all this stuff. I'm like, man, this guy's just like just keeping it going. I'm so impressed. Well, it's not like, like stop. You know, like there's never gonna be no bands playing. You know, like unless yeah. all the venues shut, and then even if that happens, I think there'll still be bands playing somewhere. So yeah, there always there always has to be like people are always gonna create music, and it, depending on the the landscape around them of you know of how they're gonna get it out or if they're gonna be able to survive. I don't, I don't really think being a band to sur- surviving on a band is something that people are. Yeah, it was hard back then, but people were actually spending money on shit back then. And now, I mean, no one wants to spend money on dick. Like, yeah, well, I mean, paid like I don't know three dollars per ten thousand streams, and that's all people are doing. Nobody's buying CDs, nobody's buying MP3s. You know, yeah. like so it is rougher. I mean, you have to have a business model that goes with that. Like, we're one of the labels that doesn't really do physical records. The bands kind of it's up to the bands to kind of do that kind of thing on their own, or we do like um, things where people can buy. Like, if we do vinyl, you can buy the vinyl, like, um, basically, if you order one vinyl, the place that we use presses just one record, you know? Like, they don't, we don't press stuff in bulk so that we have it laying around just because we're not selling it like crazy like we used to, you know? Yeah, no, totally. You know, like, print on demand is kind of the way you have to go so you're not, like, sitting on a mountain of stuff, you know? Yeah, I do that with, uh, I have, I've been putting books out lately because I have this webcomic and the service I use is print on demand. It's it's amazing because you just mark it up, you have your margin, and they'll print it per order. I'm going, this is so great. I mean, that's kind of way to survive like nowadays because some people do want vinyl of certain bands, and that's yeah. great. But printing on demand is way more economical than, you know, like hoping that you're going to sell 500 records, you know, or whatever. Like, it's just, it's too much and too much money. If bands, like, I don't know, I learned through my years that you, like, the cheaper you can do this, you know, if you're still putting out quality, quality product, you know, people are going to be there and, you know, want to hear it and they'll hear it however it's available, you know? Yeah. Cool, man. Well, I'm going to end this with two questions and uh, I'll let you be on your way to go, uh, you know, keep the scene alive. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> um, uh, what do you want to plug before I ask the last question? Well, so Mint 400 Records is uh, the label. Uh, Mint400Records.com is where you can find us online. We're doing shows, um, multiple shows per month. Uh, We're on Instagram and Facebook and all, and you could see all the different events. Just check out the label. We're always doing stuff, and we put out tons of records. And if you like the stuff that was happening in the late 90s, I think that's kind of like my taste. We have a lot of stuff that sounds like that, but we also have a lot of other stuff that's like cool indie and newer stuff, you know, with artists of all ages, from people who were doing it back then to people who are, you know, like brand new to the scene and that kind of thing. So I, I think, you know, if, if you 
dug the music that was you know going on then you might really dig the label and we have playlists on spotify and all that kind of stuff nice man all right last question what scene ethics do you hold on to to this day this whole label is diy pretty much i mean like there's records we've put out that have cost zero dollars to put out like where i've engineered produced mix master did the album artwork shot and directed the video and you know like the band didn't have to put out like a penny so i mean that whole diy thing like you know like you can't really depend on anybody to do shit for you and like i said whenever i was in bands that weren't you know good enough to be on bigger shows or weren't getting asked to do shows then i just did my own shows when i wasn't getting on the bigger record label that i wanted to get on i did my own record label you know so like diy all the way 